Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, here we go then. Am I allowed to talk about the process? <laughs> <gasps> I said it out loud. I can't talk about that. I've locked it all away, like in a vault, in an internal vault. Time. This would be on the, after the movie comes out, so. I know. Good. Fantastic. Thank you. We can talk about it, by the way. Seriously. And then when I do all the interviews, don't say anything. Then. <laughs> I was just astonished. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, it was the last thing in the world I expected. Part of me thought, oh my God, no, it's just a terrible idea. I had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I can't really see anything that I could add to it. I was surprised. I mean, you know, you think, really? We waited this long? I looked better like 10 years ago. We could have done it then. At the end of the first three films that we made, I had no thought whatsoever about revisiting the character or whether there was any ambition to bring the three characters back again. I never gave it a moment's thought. If I had been asked at the time, I probably wouldn't have imagined the potential for it. The idea of the Star Wars saga continuing felt like a very unlikely prospect. I think JJ's hesitation was everybody's hesitation initially, which is, wow, I want to do, I, I don't think it's something I can do, it's too much responsibility. Who's at risk here? What's the outcome going to be? Who's going to survive this thing? There were definitely tears from me along the way when I thought that I might not be able to do it. I still thought that I was auditioning. I thought this was the last test. I remember being scared of showing up on set and having no ideas. I just remember thinking, oh my God, we are about to shoot this thing and I'm not ready. You don't realize you start working on a Star Wars movie just how daunting that could be. Obviously, I've been talking about retiring for several years now, where I'm not in the film business anymore and I don't have to run a corporation. And it occurred to me one day that the perfect person to take over the company was Kathy and it completely caught me off guard. It was the last thing on my mind. And I almost instantly said yes. I just thought, what an incredible opportunity to step into this amazing world that George has created. But I felt that I really wanted to put the company somewhere which would protect it. When I first made Star Wars, everybody in Hollywood said, well, this is a movie Disney should have made. There's a lot of strength that is gained by this. You know, there's lots and lots of opportunities at Disney that we wouldn't have at any other studio. When the Walt Disney Company bought Lucasfilm, they very much wanted to have a movie by 2015. So the most important thing was to start to pull together the incredible talent for the film, and starting with someone like J.J. Abrams. First of all, great news in that we have a director as of about an hour ago, which seems to have hit the press already, which is J.J. Abrams. When Kathy Kenny called and asked if I'd be interested in directing this film, I fully intended to say no because I'd been involved in other movies that were sequels, and I just thought I didn't want to do that again. But it was Star Wars, and I knew Kathy. <laughs> when we were discussing it, there was this one moment that I instantly had the chills considering, which was a young woman. What her story is, I had no idea, but saying, where does Luke Skywalker? It was so titillating, the notion that this character who we all know would be discovered by some new young heroine was incredibly intriguing. I just felt to me like that was a great starting point for a story. The way I approached how we would go about making episode seven wasn't any different than what we would do with any large tentpole movie today. George really started the idea that you could put together an art department and begin conceptualizing well in advance, and that was something that we definitely took to heart. We brought in Rick Carter as our production designer, who has a long history in working with me. I think we should be considering 
how to create iconography that relates to this journey these two people are going to take in the next generation. And My approach to it anyway was to ask a very simple question first of myself and then of everybody up at uh, Lucasfilm, which was, how strong is the Force? What's its relevance now? Why make a Star Wars movie now? I felt that that was the right question to ask, and I think the explosion of the response from all the people at Lucasfilm, including the artists, were very enthusiastic about it. And Rick spent a lot of time with the art department that was Industrial Light and Magic. What we would do is we would have sort of weekly check-in meetings with JJ where we'd have a conference call, you know, a video conference call, and we would go through the art. JJ is very adamant that we kind of go back to the core aesthetics that made the original trilogy so great. And a lot of that was driven by Ralph and his sensibility. And for us, it's, it's kind of going back home in many ways, both for the visual look and the style of the movie. The idea is not to copy the original films, not at all, but they should look like they're in the same universe. So I'm kind of looking at the designs that are being done and seeing if it fits in with the films. You know there's going to be a point in this first movie and of course in this whole trilogy of rediscovering the power of the Force, both negative and positive. Is it Working with Rick, so? I asked him to join story meetings early because I wanted someone who wasn't a structuralist, not a mathematical way of, of looking at a story. It was about taking flight. But he would bring in images based on our conversations that were incredibly inspiring. Some ideas in our story literally came from some of the imagery that they brought in. We had these images that you could refer to, and some of them became kind of iconic, and they informed the real pre-production, you know, with everybody. And they would then go off and then react to that. And it was, it was kind of interesting seeing the way the two things informed each other, seeing somebody develop a script where, almost in tandem, someone was sort of illustrating it. It was very familiar to come back here. This is uh, my fourth experience with Luke's film, and they've all been very satisfying. Larry Kasdan, he was one of the first people that I picked up the phone and said, Larry, we need you to come back in and be a part of this. And he didn't miss a beat. Star Wars is so much bigger and more powerful than I ever anticipated. The reaction to Empire was so incredible and has remained for all these years. When I was doing Empire Strikes Back, my head was spinning. I really was unprepared for it, and we wrote that script very fast. Now I'm coming back to a tradition that is bigger than anything I expected. I had none of that doing Empire Strikes Back, so it's a very different experience. We would all meet in a writer's room, and it was Michael Arndt initially, Larry Kasdan, JJ, myself, and the development team. It was very much a collaborative effort, but it was Michael Arndt who was going to be putting together the first draft. He usually needs about two to three years to immerse himself in something and then actually create a screenplay. And we hoped and thought that this would maybe be one of those that would go a little bit faster, but it didn't. So when we had to make the transition to Larry Kasdan and to JJ, it actually went pretty smoothly. I've collaborated with a lot of people, and this was as much fun as I've ever had. Writing tends to be claustrophobic, airless, and tiring. This was not. The amazing thing about the process was that he took his iPhone with the recorder on, and we walked and we walked for miles and miles and miles. I'd never done this before, you know, wandering around, recording conversations. It felt good to kind of be in motion because so much of the movie is in motion. And then, because of pre-production and everything, we wound up doing that in New York, in Paris, and London. It was like heavenly. And we're, the whole time we're like figuring out, like, what's the story gonna be? What's the next Star Wars gonna be? It was all to serve this one and only mandate that we had on this process, which was, that we wanted to tell a story that would delight us and that would give us that spark, that feeling that you have when you watch Star Wars. Right now, we're working off a very unique situation where we have incredible talent. Many of those people did all the Star Wars movies. We're going to have each and every person reaching out and pulling in various people into this group so that they begin to take the baton. Because I'm one of the only people around that worked on those original films, I have a role in the show, which is sort of like some sort of past legacy hand or honor or something. Well, I have to say I feel very privileged to have been able to do all of them to this point. And to continue on and do number seven seemed very natural to me. I've had fun with it, and I feel very good about it. 
for me in particular, it was really trying to get my head around the sensibility of, okay, now that I've worked on the prequels, I know what the original series are. What is the next generation? What is the next evolution? A lot of people, including myself, have been so inspired about Star Wars and what has come before. I started here when I was 17 years old with a dream to work in film, and it's now 2015. We're making new Star Wars, and I just hope it's inspiring kids that want to be involved in filmmaking. The movie itself is a handoff, you know, to this next generation of characters that are in the Star Wars world. And behind the scenes, there is a new generation led by, you know, Kathy Kennedy. And it's quite on theme for what the movie is, bringing together the old and the new in a really seamless way. The most important thing in the master apprenticeship kind of role that we were all in, obviously George created Star Wars, but all of us had to become, in a sense, students of Star Wars. A real understanding of the history of Star Wars, that was really important. We needed to understand the rules. And once we understood that, then we could branch out. Approaching a movie like this is like approaching something that really happened in history. It's a long time ago, far, far away, but it really happened. So there's an archive, there's a place to go where you can actually see what happened. So you can see the world that Ralph McQuarrie created. All the people that actually were instrumental in, in visualizing what this galaxy could look like. There was a feeling when I was a kid, when I saw Star Wars for the first time, that it was all practical and real. I mean, there were things like being outside the sand crawler and seeing those treads, those massive treads right there. It was a physical, tangible, real thing. You knew it when you saw the movie. So we wanted to go back and embrace the look of those original films, which was all part of the feeling of how they were able to transport you into that universe trying very true to be almost like a period piece, to really put the audience back 30 years after Jedi. And so it's really doing a period science fiction film, which is really fun. Oh, that's a serious play. Yeah. Yeah. I was lucky enough on Empire Strikes Back to do some work experience within the art department, where my father was the art director. In fact, in this book, here we are, this is the um, a reproduction of the drawing that my father did for the snow speeder on Empire Strikes Back. I couldn't believe that when I first came in and spoke to him here at Pinewood, he said he was working on drawings that I'd done 36 years ago. <laughs> and you think, I can't believe they were still have this stuff. So it's wonderful that they had some of the drawings that we'd done all those years ago. I love characters like this, you know, they feel like they're, they're just sort of, I believe them and they'll sort of blend in. JJ sort of threw a creative challenge to us. You know, in some films in the past, you would get a build list and you would say, I've got to build this, 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 and this. I think for JJ, the first priority is let's shoot it practically. But we kind of had to earn our stars, so you had to get that character to a point that it was worthy of going on the screen. The progress is happening, and I know that it might feel a little bit like wheel spinning and stuff, but like the more you guys are inspired by ideas, I'm telling you that there will be value in other places in the movie, so it's, it is very helpful. He never really said that he would use anything, that anything that you make, it's not a ticket to appear in the film, it was that we would show something to JJ and we would impress him enough for him to say, I can use that. Keep coming, keep coming. And so the interaction of those physical things actually creates something that's not artificial seeming, it doesn't seem arbitrary. And then, of course, so that will be augmented by the visual effects. You film what you can, and you build what you can, and then if you want to see more, we have this wonderful magician of, of ILM that will come in and say, well, of course we can see more. It was great to hear that they were going to try and do as, as much on set as possible, because, you know, really it's hard to beat. We always try and augment our CG with live action elements. It gives a, a greater sense of reality, of course. We've been used to being asked to do more and more and, and use our technology to the fullest, so you have to take a step back and think, how am I going to use technology in a way that is actually going to have it feel like a film from, you know, 1977? 
what was important to us was to capture again that feeling, that authenticity that we we're looking for. We've got so many different tools that can contribute to that feeling cinematically. And obviously working with ILM has been a huge, huge benefit. I think the interesting thing about Star Wars and, this, and the kind of storytelling it is, is it's a story that allows you to participate. There are things that are relevant, things you're identifying with. Certainly for all young kids when the movie came out, they either wanted to be Luke Skywalker or they saw themselves as Han Solo. And I think that was a part of our challenge, was how are we gonna bring new characters into this series that had that same kind of power. And I think we have. I mean, I think one of the great things is we have a female lead. What we were looking for was someone new. And this character needed to be vulnerable and tough, sweet and terrified. And to find someone that no one knew who could do all these things took a lot of looking. You always feel like you're gonna run out of time. And you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> but our casting directors, Nina Gold, April Webster, and Alyssa Weisberg just did an incredible amount of work. And we were very lucky to find some great people, but the truth is it wasn't until we found Daisy that we just felt like she was capable of doing all of these things this character required. Where are we? Through my guest. When we brought her in, I asked her to do this one scene, sort of this torture scene, very sort of intense, and she just blew my mind. She's reaching this depth of struggle and tears are streaming down her face. I thought, this is unbelievable. And I asked her to stop, give her a couple of adjustments, do it again, and she just, she did it again, and I thought, oh my God. I guarantee he would have disappointed you. Get out of my head. The decision to have Finn be a deserting stormtrooper was one of the biggest that we made. I thought it would be incredible if we pulled our hero from the ranks of what has been essentially faceless, indistinguishable automatons who no one ever gave any attention to, really. That someone had to be inside there. John Boyega was one of the biggest Star Wars fans among the cast, and he auditioned, I think, nine times. Do you know how to fly a TIE fighter? I can fly anything. Why are you doing this? Because it's the right thing to do. You need a pilot. I need a pilot. There he was, proof that just because you keep getting called back and it feels like it might not ever happen, it actually can. Yes, keep it in there. The conversation was kind of JJ, like, really explaining to me how things would change and if I felt supported and what have you. And he wanted to know about my background because we hadn't really talked about um, my family. He asked me whether I was ready, and he was like, do you realize how much of a big responsibility this is? And what for, please? He said to me, are you sure you want this? And I was like, if you believe in me, then I think I'm OK with that, because I think you're pretty cool and pretty good at what you do. He goes, well, you're the new star of Star Wars. And then everything stopped. You know when, like, you're waiting for something and then the, the words actually come and you're like, uh, okay? He just said, I'm the new star of Star Wars. And he was like, no, 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 don't react, don't react. Breathe, breathe. JJ said, you can tell your parents. So I got in and my sister and my mum were there and I was like, I got Star Wars. And then it was like, oh, my God. So, yeah, but I couldn't sleep that night at all. It was really, really hard just going through normal life without saying that I was cast in Star Wars. But, yeah, that is the story of how it happened. For those of us that have been working on this now for almost two years, it's incredible to realise that we're at this point right now. We had a cast read-through just before we started shooting. It was really moving. Carrie and Harrison and Mark, I don't think any of them ever imagined that they would be shooting any more of these movies ever again. I can't say that I didn't have some reservation about it. It wasn't hard to convince me. It's just that I had not imagined the circumstance. I was very nervous. It was trippy to have Harrison and Mark and myself in a room together doing this again. This was gonna be the first gathering of this original cast, new cast, but the most important thing was to hear it and actually experience what is it like to get it on its feet in a read-through. We'd never done that before. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Star Wars Episode Seven. 
At the last minute, I was asked to read the actual script. Usually the director does that. But in this case, he said he wanted to be able to observe and would I do that? The Falcon and the surviving X-Wings roar past camera toward a planet with green flora and a copper sea. This is Dakar. The ship's descending among massive mushroom-shaped trees. That here, moment when we all sat in a circle and we saw all these faces, you couldn't believe what you were seeing. The young people and the veterans, this is a moment that will never be forgotten. Hold on Luke Skywalker's incredible face, amazed and conflicted at what he sees as our music builds. The promise of an adventure just beginning. The end. Mm. On the one hand, you had this sort of out of body, oh my God, I'm in this place with this crew. On the other hand, you had the most sort of primal terror of, oh my God, it was also the beginning of production. That moment is like when you're at the starting point of the wagon train, you know, and everybody's gathering, you say, who's that and who's that? I don't think we ever really felt like we were ready to go. I know probably somewhere deep down they felt like, is this going to work? We're going out to face who knows what. Things about that was literally not having downtime to really worry about it. What I remember feeling was incredibly hot. It was. <laughs> It was about 120 plus degrees Fahrenheit. It was a beautiful, beautiful desert location, really incredible, but tough for everybody that was in any kind of costumes, that kind of thing. It was a, a very tough way to start, but it looks fantastic. First day, sandy, sandy it's hot, it was absolutely amazing. We walked to set. I see this huge, life-size TIE fighter crashed in the sand. For me, it was just amazing just looking around and taking it in and saying, I am here. We are about to film this movie. And J.J. Abrams, with his enthusiasm and his energy coming in and saying that we're starting Star Wars Episode Seven. Uh, I just want to say the, uh, the obvious, which is that we are here on day one of Star Wars Episode Seven. You're here. How incredible is that? You don't need anything. You need a bag. You are. What is your helmet? Okay, very good. You can go. You're wonderful. Let's get you deep background. Excellent. All right, should we uh, rehearse one more time? I just remember I was told that oh Daisy's doing her first scene, so I was just like okay, let me go down and go see it. What was Daisy. the first scene when I was scrubbing the thing? My arm was aching. I know. I was just relaxing and you were just working so hard. And you were just there like this. Oh, my arm was aching and I kept not being able to get it right. Oh, oh yeah? Oh, my God. <laughs> when we got the first actual scene, it was exciting to see what she was doing and to hear her interaction with JJ. Here it is. These are the dailies from the first day of the new Star Wars film. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Daisy's character lives, and we're getting ready to shoot her outside of her AT-AT home. We've built as much of it as we can afford, and we have a lot to get in the little time we have at dusk, so we just look. If you could put it on because it sort of like makes you feel good, you sort of like in a weird way relate to what the rebellion did. When you put it on, it feels like you settle in more, almost, Okay. when you put it on. Abu Dhabi was really hard at the beginning. I'd obviously never worked on this scale on anything. And because the first day was just me, it felt like quite a lot of pressure. Action Daisy! My God, you could literally feel the sand burning through your shoes, which was crazy. That and camera. And wake up! Then obviously, Finn has to be in the Stormtrooper outfit. So let's just say it was a combination of sweat, passion, ice cubes, and a lot of water. A lot of acting involved, but at the same time, not a lot, because it's hot, I'm exhausted. The location we ended up on was just so stunning. The sand dunes were breathtaking. So to be able to shoot widescreen cinema out there was for me, what I personally love to go to the cinema for is to see locations, places I don't get to see all the time. What was made clear to me very early on was that it was going to be shot on film, which is something that I love. I love working with film. 
when you're making Star Wars, there's really no choice but to shoot it on film. You have to, because the originals were shot on film and it's very much part of how we remember them looking and feeling. There's something that you need to capture on celluloid, no question. What you brought me today is worth one quarter portion. It's about 40 degrees, I guess, so it's hot in there, but it's Star Wars. I burned for Star Wars. <laughs> I've worked with JJ many times. When I heard that he was doing Star Wars, obviously I was immediately on the phone, like, what, what are you, what, what? I sort of said, oh, I've got to come visit. And he said, yeah, maybe you should do a voice in it or something, you know, like be a droid. Because I kind of thought that being in it as me, as my face, I think people go, oh, it's him from Star Trek. It might spoil it. So I was kind of torn because I was desperate to obviously at least be part of it in some way. And then we discussed the idea of me playing a character who was in full prosthetic, which meant I could have my space cake and eat it. That's mine! <laughs> we might in that wood jumper. In Abu Dhabi, it was more cardio than anything else. And so a few weeks before the Abu Dhabi shoot, we were on the treadmill doing interval running. And what that did was just copied what happens on set. We would run super fast, we'd be running with the camera, a 20 second take. We'd breathe for a bit and JJ would be like, let's go again. Not this way! And cut. Uh, Stop two. And uh, uh. Without the guys we were training with, there's just no way. Neither me or John would have been able to get through Abu Dhabi. Keep me in shape, keeping the girls. It was really hard. The actual hardest bit was when it was soft sand, hard sand, and one of the last runs was just a mix of the two, and that's just like a killer on the legs. Like, it was almost a relief when there was explosions, because you knew, like, there was only so many times that you could do the running. Three, two, one. Set, good energy, background action, and action BB-8. We just ran BB-8 from the gates to escape from the TIE fighter attack, and uh, I wasn't quite expecting that today. It was very conscious on our part that there would be a new droid who's a major part of the story, and he's funny and sweet. I didn't go through the film thinking, oh, this is going to be iconic. Oh, BB-8, it's like our version of R2. I never really thought of it like that. Mm. I was just like, oh, you're so cute. And as you're walking, you're going to kind of glance at him, sort of slightly annoyed that he's convinced you to take him. He was the first character I had real scenes with, and I was nervous because it's not a human being. But because of the puppeteers, he comes alive. Dave's doing the head, and Brian's doing the LEDs on the body, and I've got the drive system on This version of BB-8 is the puppet version, and he is fundamentally a rod puppet, and I have uh, control of him here. I can just do the gross body movement on the ball. And this has been the model we've used most of all as you get a really instant and organic performance with it. What about the droid? What about him? I asked JJ if I could have a bit more with BB-8 because I think it's such a nice bond, it's such a nice relationship. He's this talisman, I guess, that is the first constant that Ray has ever had. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much. You've been spectacular. It's been the most fun, the greatest adventure. Uh, I, I, I cannot believe that we've, we've done the shoot here in Abu Dhabi. We can't thank you enough. We will uh, we love you forever. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Slate one, take one. We're actually in Pinewood Studios, and this is one of the stages that we shot on. One of many, actually. Okay, cut. Got it. In large part, this is the home of Star Wars because so many of the movies were made in England. It's pretty great. Returning to the UK and setting ourselves up at Pinewood and working with these crews and working with generations of people who go back to the early days of Star Wars.
The crews were not only amazing, but a lot of the crews had parents who had worked on the originals, so it really felt like a homecoming. Working at Pinewood was another incredible experience in this. This was a studio where some of the great movies of all time were shot. This is the studio where the James Bond films are made. You can't help but have reverence for the actual studio. We have pretty much every large stage at Pinewood, and we filled them up, and we'll fill them up several times on this movie, you know, switching them around to other sets. We have a massive amount of construction and office and warehouse space here as well. We have both back lots that have big builds on, and we've been here for a long time. We started building months, months in advance of filming. fortunate when we got Oscar Isaac to play Poe's character because the role of Han in the first three movies, he's the one that draws your eye because you don't know what he's going to do. It's an archetype that all of us like. We wanted someone like that to be in this group. There's definitely elements of Han Solo in Poe. You know, the cockiness of, of a fighter pilot, because fighter pilots are, I mean, these guys are incredible. The amount of things that have to be going on in their head at once. Originally, Poe was going to die early in the film, and that was the script that Oscar saw. And one of his issues, wanting to do this movie, was that he'd made like four movies in which he died early on. And he was sick of dying early on. A week or so later, J.J. wrote me and he said, got it figured out, Poe's in the rest of the movie now. And so this idea that Poe comes back was something that was added later, which obviously for me was incredibly exciting and, and, uh, and fantastic. I get to live. Going forward, you know, what he'll add to the fight against the uh, First Order will be really exciting to see where that goes. Boom! Stormtroopers are formidable now. They have all sorts of new weaponry, they have a new way of fighting, and they're vicious and quite scary. When you see them on the set running out of those transport vehicles, it's frightening. I'm the crowd second AD on the movie, and when uh, I heard that JJ was interested in getting some girls into Stormtroopers costumes, I was like, well, I'm kind of tall, I'll give that a go. Moving your arms is not too bad, and moving your legs is okay. I guess it's start, I can start to feel like on my back a little bit of weight. Think, on, some of the boys like said it's shoulders. Yeah. yeah, like a heavy rucksack yeah. going on. Yeah. And go on, go do it. Go on, That was really exciting, yeah. really exciting. I was a bit worried about getting up the hill, because once the momentum has gone from going down the slope, going back up again is pretty tough. I'm absolutely loving it. It's like, I feel like a child. <laughs> Goodies and baddies and shooting lots of people, it's great. Captain Phasma is the first female Star Wars villain. I find it very heartening that a franchise like Star Wars, it makes it a progressive character, it makes it a modern character, a new relationship with a female character, which isn't about her being sexualized. It's about us responding to the choices that she makes. So this just rests on the shoulders so this just... I was talking to Michael Kaplan, who I've idolized since I watched Blade Runner, about how he came to the design of Captain Phasma. They did these beautiful illustrations of Kilo Ren in silver. JJ said, I don't see Kilo Ren that way, but I love the idea. Weeks went by and Kathy came in and she said, what is that? Pointing at the knight in shining armor. She said, that's amazing. She said, that has to be in the movie. So that's how Captain Phasma came to be. I was told that I was going to absolutely love my costume and they put the helmet on me. I looked in the mirror and I think I just giggled quite a lot. I thought it was great that they had not feminized the armor. I thought that was fantastic. But I thought, it's good to know there's a woman in there. So maybe subtly I can let that come across in the way that she stands, in the way that she holds her body. It isn't sexualized, but there is something occasionally of a femininity to give this character a little bit more of an identity. The name came because looking at the chrome design of Phasma's uniform, it reminded me of the movie Phantasm. 
and there's this chrome ball in Don Coscarelli's film, this kind of devil ball with spikes on it. I always loved the design of that. So when we were looking at this, I thought, you know, Phantasm and Phasma. And it was a weird name, but it felt like a fun Star Warsy name. Good, good. Exactly yes. that. People want to tell you what your character is, and they have like such a vocabulary for those movies. Everyone likes to tell you you're a villain. I don't think villains think of themselves as villains. I think they probably really think that as more being right, that they feel justified, and I think that makes somebody even more dangerous. The villain in training is interesting for me because in talking about villains in Star Wars, you don't and can't get better than Darth Vader. It's sort of the thing. They had created an image that was unmistakable. You don't need any explanation. The guy walks through the smoke, you get the whole thing. And he's the most threatening villain of all time. The idea that this is a character who's influenced by that darkness started to allow a masked villain, which feels essential in a Star Wars universe, to take form and not feel like we were being naive and acting like there wasn't a Darth Vader. Maybe putting on the mask makes him feel more powerful. It makes perfect sense that this guy has had a huge impact on everybody. And yes, this figure looms large for our villain, too. There's so many nods to Vader and how you first meet him. And I think JJ was after something more youthful and unpredictable and someone who isn't polished. And even in his lightsaber, it's not quite finished, you know, and his uniform is not quite perfect. He was by far the most difficult character to nail down. JJ was our barometer. He looked at hundreds of sketches, and the design that we had in the helmet, suddenly we thought of it as being chromed. I liked the idea of light being reflected. It was an interesting process that I've never done before to be able to tell a lot of story without actually being seen. And then what is the difference when he takes off his mask? What do you find? Instead of this menacing figure that you're used to, or someone that's kind of like more mustache twirly and obvious, there was actually someone more human. JJ always wanted him to have a cape and a hood. I had it patterned so that there would be a lot of movement when he was fighting. There's chips taken out of it. It's not perfect. It's less manicured, that costume. Putting it on, it was like such a <laughs> an event. I was so pissed by the time you know we were ready to start shooting that I felt totally ready. The Millennium Falcon is as much a returning character in this movie as any of the people. And there's a, a very weird feeling about going back to something you know so well. It's a little bit like if you were to say, I'm going to open this magic door, and behind that magic door is your bedroom at nine years old. That kind of a feeling of it's yours, and you know it. And so when you go back to it, it can't not look the way you remember it. It has to be what you know. So our art director, Mark Harris, who worked on Empire, was like a scientist in forensically recreating the Falcon. Mark Harris went through every known photograph of the Falcon. We studied that, every nut and bolt. I mean, it's what you dream of as a kid, to play with stuff like that. I love building, and to make something like that, every day I come to work smiling. And it was made in waves. We had to make it piece by piece by piece so we knew it would all work. And the last piece to be made, believe it or not, was actually the curved sofa, which we took a long time to actually get that right, even down to... Rap, just giggling. I just, I went through that whole place messing it all up. And all the props people and the guys on set were just kind of like, okay, can you control him? Because I started running and I went to the cockpit. You know, the little ball thing, the Jedi training yeah. ball. I got that out, I started rolling that around. Oh, it was so fun. So I walked onto that set, completely overwhelming. I really am at sixes and sevens, to say the least. And then they introduced me to Harrison Ford. <laughs> I had nothing to say. I'm getting horrible deja vu. I feel I should, I should play chess. <laughs> <laughs>
Now be careful, R2. Taking on the redux of the chess set, the idea that I pitched uh, JJ was that we pick up the, the chess set where we left off. And we pretty much go back to that frame where the little guy is getting back up, and the big guy is coming to grab him again, and the little guy, like, bang, bonks him. It felt like coming full circle again. He just stepped back into 1977. My favorite personal story, I was shopping at a random department store, and sure enough, who do I run into it was Harrison Ford. I tapped him on the shoulder, I said, Mr. Ford, so my name's Darren, I'm one of the production designers on Star Wars. I'm actually building the Millennium Falcon right now, and he goes, the toggle switches. And I go, toggle switches? He goes, when we built it the first time, none of the toggle switches had any springs in them. They'd bought broken switches because they were much cheaper. So if you stood there long enough, the switch which was in this position and you moved to this position would slowly come down behind you while you were standing there because there was no spring in it. No budget for springs. Okay. And I was here. Can you put the springs in the switches this time? He says, yeah, boss, we got the, we got the budget for that. As cool as it is, and as beautifully done as it is, you very quickly realize the scene is not gonna be good just because it's there. The story has to be working for that very cool location to not feel squandered. And so it was really important with Han Solo that he'd be introduced in a way that felt worthy of these sets that were being built. And also, well, I want the fans to feel like we're doing this right from the beginning, and is this gonna serve them? Everyone was waiting for the line, which was Chewie, we're home. And we had given it the whole day because JoJo really wanted it to be perfect. Han and Chewie entering the Falcon. I turned around and there must have been 200 people standing behind me, all staring at the monitor, wanting to see Harrison come into the Millennium Falcon for the first time. That was a huge moment. And camera. Action. Chewie, we're home. Dear Peter is present on the set, offering his invaluable experience and advice. And it was great to have him there. Getting back to the old days, the old ways of doing things. Yeah. It's great. I wasn't walking very well because I tore a tendon in this knee about two years ago. That meant a knee replacement because Peter's knees are not good. For many of the scenes, Jonas, who was a kind of stunt Chewy, is in the role. When I put on the suit, I start rehearsing. I start doing what Peter does, and like this little, little uh, wobbles, and uh, these Chewy-like awkward things that he does. Awkward, but lovable. I have had words with him about what Chewie does and what he doesn't do, and being relatively the same height does help. I think I'm a little bit shorter than Peter was at his prime. At this point, I'm seven feet. I believe he's seven two. Okay, yeah. I'm glad that they've given him the opportunity to be able to come and do as much as possible and get the old gang back together again. Well, you tell them Han Solo just stole back the Millennium Falcon for good. We're about to shoot the scene where it's a little private moment of him in the cockpit. This is a kind of sweet little privileged moment to see him alone, taking it in, reunited with uh, the ship that he loves so much. I'd been away so long, I looked at it and said, this doesn't look right. Was this, was this here? And they said, yes. I said, I don't remember that, but OK. I've spent a lot of years here, and it was fun to see it again. There are things I remember about the cockpit and some of the funny stuff we went through. Without precise calculations, we fly too close to a store. <laughs> They're bouncing to a supermarket, and then. <laughs> Hey.
be exciting. Okay. And after a beat of stopping and looking, we'll cue the music again, and you'll, you'll start playing the music again. We wanted to develop a whole story that the castle was a place where people could come to escape and find a home with mass. It's a communal place to make deals, plan heists. <laughs> Ooh. Hey, Maz. Maz, she's four feet tall, but she runs the joint, and everybody knows that. She's a woman who challenges people to find their purpose. You've been running away from this fight for too long. Maz was a character that you meet at the moment in the film when things kind of come to a necessary pause. And she was inspired by a teacher that he had. JJ had this legendary teacher named Rose Gilbert. They were like, Maz's character's going to be Rose Gilbert. We've had pictures of Rose Gilbert all over our workstations when we were drawing. I definitely think that the spirit of her is very much present in that character. We initially talked about doing her as a character that was gonna be performed with a puppet. Then we talked about doing it as an animatronic character, and then we realized, A, we hadn't found the design early enough that we all agreed on, and B, it felt like it was actually gonna be limiting. Well, I know that JJ has been fascinated with motion capture, and it was something that he was really keen to have in his film, the embracing of the old guard of doing things and the new. CG has gotten to a place where if you have a good enough team doing it and we have the best in the business at ILM, then you're able to have it be indistinguishable from what's real. On set, everything feels so real. And then there's me in this head cam walking around <laughs> covered in dots. There's 149 dots put on my face every morning. It was the most alienating thing in the world. Because there are lights shining on my face, everybody is drawn to look at me. And you're still trying to figure out how on earth you're supposed to be a completely different person in this suit. <laughs> this is, is that cool? <laughs> The principal photography for me has been like a technical rehearsal. And then there's a whole other process in a volume where we zero in on my performance and get the nuances of that. She's good at that. <laughs> I became part of this whole thing from two different angles, as an overseer, if you like, or a consultant to do with performance capture. And then, of course, I was also playing the part of Snoke, the nemesis character and general and leader of the dark side in this particular version. If Skywalker returns, the new Jedi will rise. One of the things that J.J. was very, very keen on was not to fall into the trap of over-characterization, you know, pushing it too far. It can end up being a caricature if you're not careful. We will stop them before they reach Skywalker. Go. Oversee preparations. Yes, Supreme Leader. I was 25 foot up sitting on a throne, very divorced from the rest of the actors, my voice coming through speakers. It's not like you're standing next to another actor and relating to them in, in, in a more direct way. It's, so it is easy to push the character really too far. It doesn't feel yet right. Andy has been a great support. He has encouraged me as much as possible to let go of the oddness of the things I'm wearing and just find the character as I would in any other circumstance. Solo, what is she doing? I don't know, but it ain't good. Hmm. So we're on E-Stage, which is the resistance base, and it is one of the first sets that we actually designed and originally was conceived when there was more of a jungle up above. But the idea of the roots was something that I loved so much, feeling that it was really underground, and part of it is that sort of, obviously, the kinship with the original Star Wars uh, jungle base. We would have vines and roots intertwined with cables and the kind of makeshift base that the resistance has. So at the very beginning of this, you say it's a Death Star, and then you say, wish that were the case, uh, maybe four feet above the center of the table, that expands to a big sphere that would basically be the diameter of 
circle. They're trying to say it's circle. The scene that made me feel like, oh my gosh, this is crazy, is when all of the casts are around that table planning. I just want to say one more thing when everyone's done. Yeah, yeah. The moment that meant the most to me personally was Akbar was on set. Steps here. Step. And, you know, security's been so tight, we're not allowed to take pictures or anything, but I had to take a picture of Akbar on set and show it to my brothers because we, we loved Akbar. You know, it's a trap. How is it possible to power a weapon of that size? It uses the power of the sun. You see General Akbar speaking, and you couldn't buy this as a Star Wars fan. It doesn't get any cooler than that. I can shut down the shields, but I need to be there on the planet. I mean, that scene was incredible, though. Poe Dameron's there, Harrison was there, C-3PO, Princess Leia, R2-D2's in the corner. This is R2-D2's tent. Uh, this is Lee, this is Oliver. Both guys responsible for making the R2-D2's on the film. We brought in fans who were also people working in the business, so we had different degrees of obsession. I just studied electromechanical engineering and needed a hobby. So I joined the R2 Builders Club in 2003, and it wasn't until sort of 2007 I actually had my R2 almost finished. I went to Star Wars Celebration Europe, and we had sort of backstage passes, and I was very cheeky and asked Kathleen Kennedy if they were making a film, and they needed any droids to contact me. And then a few months later, I got sort of an email, and here we are. Oliver kindly invited me to join him on board with this job. Coming here on a daily basis, five days a week, I, I don't take it for granted any second I'm here, you know, it, it is unbelievable. Anthony Daniels came over mid-shoot and said, you know, what a good job we'd done and how they compare to the old ones. He was impressed, which was a big compliment from someone that's worked with so many R2-D2s. BB-8, you're wasting your time. In the first film, in episode four, 3PO, his left leg was silver. And the idea was that 3PO had a history. Star Wars didn't just happen out of nowhere. It wasn't page one of a new story. But you were kind of tuning into a oh, chapter here. Move forward, and JJ takes that idea several notches higher. I wanted to make sure that when you saw 3PO in The Force Awakens, that you knew it was from this era and this moment. I wanted to mark him in a way. 3PO, he has a red arm. Because something's happened to him in the last 30 years. The rebels have had all sorts of dramas, and one of his was clearly losing a limb. And then, oh, hey, here's, here's one. It's not the right color, but we'll spray it later. And the idea was he's been burdened with this damn red appendage, and by the end of the movie, he's gotten his arm back. You know, he's got his proper arm reinstalled. The story as to how he got his red arm is actually going to be in a comic book that they're doing as a separate piece. who is born with equal parts, good and evil. He is someone who is broken. Forgive me. I feel it again. The pull to the light. There's nothing more powerful than genetics. If you really imagine the stakes of him in his youth, having all these special powers and having your parents kind of be absent during that process on their own agendas, equally as selfish. He's lost in the world that he was raised in and feels that he was kind of abandoned by the people that he's closest with. He's angry because of that, I think, and he has a huge grudge on his shoulders. But it's more than just having sort of a bad seed as a kid. Snoke had targeted this kid who knew that this kid was gonna be incredibly powerful in the Force and wanted him as an ally. So this mother and her father had a target for a son. Someone was watching their boy. Light in him, I know it. The fun of celebrating the return of these characters that we know is certainly a part of this movie, but I never felt like we were telling a story about Leia, Luke, or Han necessarily. It felt like a, a story about a generational handoff, that this was really a story about Rey, about Finn, about Poe, about Kylo Ren. And you can't have that handoff without cost. And background. Action. You know, no matter how much we fought, I've always hated watching you leave. It needed to serve this purpose of giving our new characters the mantle. And that was a big 
scary decision. If you see our son, bring him home. So we had to deal with that, and there was a lot of discussion about it, and JJ and I went back and forth and talked about a lot of different things, and this is where we came. It was the scene, I think, that terrified me the most. And yet it was an absolutely critical part of the story and mostly, perhaps, for the villain of the piece. His destiny is resolved in a powerful and effective way. Right, let me go over there. And then three, two, one, two. And that's yours. I remember a specific time walking on set with Harrison and him saying, you know, look what we get to do. For me, that was like an amazing moment because he's someone who's accomplished so much. He's just as in awe of the process and, and feels so lucky to be involved in it. It's a very inspiring thing. Bang! Bang! I enjoyed playing the character in the first. I enjoyed playing the character in the second. By the time we got to the third, I thought there was possibly no useful purpose for this character except as a human sacrifice. It's not that I wanted Han Solo to die. I wanted Han Solo to be able to lend some significant emotional weight to the story. I was resolved to be useful and to pass on the responsibilities to others and get out of the way. I would like, when you say you have the detonator, you should, yeah. Jonas should, should hold that, that thing up. Yeah, yeah make sure it's like that. We spent a lot of time keeping as few people as possible on the set, and, you know, it's a serious scene. It was emotional. It was emotional for the actors, both Harrison and Adam Driver. I wanted to avoid that scene as much as possible, and then it was also very excited to do it, but to go to that place, uh, what it brought up in, in myself was a lot. And action! kidding here. This is serious stuff, and we wanted it to be right. You have all these things that are going on in your head, but that really goes away when you're staring across from that other person. Ben! The unique and very deeply emotional and troubling way in which uh, Han Solo meets his fate, I thought gives incredible opportunity and helps realize the full potential of the character that Adam Driver plays. He was so generous that there really wasn't much I had to do other than respond to him. think how people are going to react to that. It was a necessary component. This is not just the Force Awakens in a young woman. This is the dark side of the Force awakening in the villain. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment we should acknowledge. It wraps a man who uh, was a hero to us before this movie, but he's even more so today. And I cannot thank you enough for it the gift of you in this movie. We love you. Here's the fourth one. Luke Skywalker was for me always the way into Star Wars. This movie was always very much about getting to him. If you imagine a place where the Jedi Order could have actually first emerged, that's what led me to Skellig Island at the end of this movie.
because this is a place that emerged in 600 AD as a Christian retreat from the world. It's an ancient site of a monastery, and it's like nothing you've ever seen, ever. And only 50 people could go onto the island. It's a very small island, and there were 600 and some steps to the top, and everything had to be brought up, you know, by hand. Once you get up there, boy, it's so beautiful and so magical. There was a point where I was as off to myself as you could be, and I was sort of far down the path and the ocean beyond, and this feeling came over me that hadn't happened since Tunisia on the very first one, because I was there out in the desert, and I had this really strong feeling that I was in another worldly place, because you really felt, I'm there. Skellig was the first meeting of Ray and Luke. And so late on, there's such a big build-up. There's a real ambiguity as to what his reaction is. I think he has great reservations. He's really conflicted. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. While this was never his story, this movie, it was all about him. It was all about how critical Luke is to the continuation of this amazing story. So what I'm most excited about is the story of Luke Skywalker and where it goes. I think for many people, a marker is Star Wars. I know it's a film, but actually it means much more than that. For me, Star Wars seemed like a kind of universe that might accept me. There might be a place for me in that universe. People love it so much. It is a family experience. That's what it is, it's not even a movie. Just families do Star Wars together. It's a verb. I don't think there's anything quite like it in the history of film, but we have the opportunity over decades to take the same material, use it again, and add something to it and revoice it and rework it. It's been a challenge, and it's been fun, and it's been certainly a privilege. I think in the end, I have to say that I just feel very grateful. This is like an opportunity to thank everyone for a lifetime of support, of love, if it weren't for the fans, we wouldn't be sitting here. And I've never forgotten that. The other day, I was looking at that original poster, and I was remembering there was something about Star Wars that made me feel like anything was possible, that like when you see that star field, it felt like every point of light was a story. The value that people place in these stories is deep and abiding. These stories have been passed down in families from generation to generation. It becomes valuable as a family experience, and so it's passed on, like family history. We'll see each other.